Good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming out today. For those who are following online or on social media, the hashtag for the discussion now and all day is hashtag fiscal summit. So let's get going. Uh, Congressman Kilmer, Congressman Reed, you all in the Problem Solvers Caucus have released bipartisan plans on immigration, on health care, several projects. What is the bipartisan plan for fiscal policy? Congressman Reed? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here with you this morning and, and to our host. Uh, I will tell you the, the Peterson Foundation has done yeoman's work in regards to highlight this issue uh, that is upon us, and that's the debt crisis. Uh, the debt crisis uh, right now, in my opinion, is going off as we speak. And uh, it's going to take bipartisan solutions in order to address, as we all know, the root cause of this issue. And uh, what that is is just unsafe fiscal policies here out of Washington, D.C. And it also is, is, are policies that are ultimately, if go unattended to, are going to put millions of Americans into harm's way because we will be in the crisis moment. And anytime you adopt policy in a crisis moment, I will tell you, I think everyone will agree, that's probably not the best policy to enact. So uh, I'm proud to be up here uh, with my good friend, uh, Derek Kilmer, who uh, truly has become a friend. We, we are in this Problem Solvers Caucus group, this 24 Democrat, 24 Republican a uh, group that came together about a year and a half ago and said enough is enough of gridlock in Washington, D.C. Let's put the American people first. And what we're working on together are policies where we don't shed our ideology, if you would. I'm a proud conservative Republican. I know Derek is a proud uh, Democrat. And, and we bring that to the table. But what we do not do in that conversation is, is allow that to block us from getting to the common ground. We will engage in the conversation. And uh, on the debt issue, you know, what we're looking at is good, sound tax policy, good, sound and, uh, reforms to the mandatory programs, be it Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, we have not got to a 75% consensus position. That's the, the caucus's internal rule as to when we take a formal position on policy that we can support as a block of 48 to vote together. Um, but we're, we're digesting it and we're, we're getting to that common ground more and more on all the issues that you've highlighted, such like health care, immigration, um, gun violence, some of these really tough issues that we're demonstrating to the House and to the Senate that it can be done if you're willing to trust each other and have an honest conversation. Congressman Kilmer. Well, um, I want to start first uh, echo uh, Tom's gratitude to the, to the Peterson Foundation for hosting this. Part of the way we address the debt problem is by shining a, lot, a light on the debt problem. I don't think that's happened enough in this town, certainly recently. Um, I think Michael's comment is right on target. You know, unfortunately, we seem to be taking a pro-cyclical approach um, uh, uh, rather than when we have a strong economy trying to get our fiscal house in order. Congress seems to be going in the wrong direct direction. To answer your question directly, so far there isn't one. Uh, so far there isn't a bipartisan proposal to address our nation's long-term fiscal sustainability. There's some pieces that are in play. Um, and I'll, uh, as part of the uh, CAPS agreement a couple months back, uh, one of those pieces was the creation of something called the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform, which really rolls off the tongue. <laughs> um, uh, great opportunity for rebranding that. But um, the reality is part of the problem right now is uh, uh, there are process problems within the Congress. On the spending side, um, you know, just this fiscal year you saw five continuing resolutions two government shutdowns. And so it is very difficult for Congress as a body to get a handle on long-term fiscal challenges when it can barely keep the lights on. So part of the effort of that new uh, Joint Select Committee, and I serve on it, is to try to figure out, okay, how do we get, how do we put some process improvements in place that allow us both to keep the lights on and avert sh the threat of shutdown, uh, and two, to um, create a process where uh, the long-term fiscal sustainability of the country is more front and center. If in a Republican-controlled Congress, in a Democratic-controlled Congress, there has been a repeating pattern of deficit finance spending, 
if the middle there seems to continue to be deficit, deficit finance spending. So how do you then change where the center is if both parties seem perfectly willing to finance their projects and their policy proposals with debt and deficit? I guess the, I mean, I don't know if this is good news or, or not, but the reality is every bipartisan uh, group, every nonpartisan group, every think tank, that has looked at our nation's debt problem has pretty much concluded the same thing. This problem's too big just to tax your way out of it. It's too big just to cut your way out of it. And it's too big to depend on economic growth as a strategy out of it. Rather, you have to have a comprehensive solution. What that means is a group like the Problem Solvers Caucus is actually pretty well positioned to try to, to do something about it. One, in part, because it means that both parties are gonna have to swallow a little bit of something that they don't like um, to, to try to uh, address it. It, it begs for a bipartisan solution. What happened to Republicans as fiscal conservatives? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, as one who opposed the, the recent uh, budget caps deal as well as the uh, uh, omnibus uh, spending, uh, that was the exact question I asked. And uh, uh, to me, it, it represents the, the thing I find in DC. I've been here since 2010, uh, been working on this issue. This is the reason I ran. This is the reason I. I am here because I am so concerned about this debt crisis impacting my kids and my grandchildren that don't even exist yet and, and dealing with it. And one of the things I found through the last, um, you know, that just this last cycle, it's easy. The, the path is easier to spend money. It is easier. It, it is hard to have these conversations. When I voted for essentially Simpson Bowles, the Cooper Latourette budget, I was one of 38 Republicans that stepped forward, put my name in black and white, and I will tell you it was the best vote I ever took. Now, that was my personal opinion. Well, I got attacked quite a bit for doing that. But at the end of the day, it's going to take us leading into this. It's going to take us recognizing this problem and say, look, we, can't, we have to have a conversation about what are the priorities in America, how can we do this in a reasonable fashion. And it's not just taking on the discretionary spending where the omnibus, uh, the, this budget bill, this uh, spending bill that we just passed, uh, that is one third uh, of the federal spend. We have to have an honest conversation about Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, mandatory spending. And when you start getting into those uh, issues, I will tell you the easier path is to do nothing, status quo, and also use it, what I find in this town is the top priority at times, political campaigns. And especially as you get closer to elections, most of the camps want to go into their camps, both on the left and the right, and just fight because they want to have that gavel in order to be in control to then deal with the priorities that they want to attack. And so from a Republican's perspective, that is one of my biggest disappointments, uh, that we did not follow up what we did on tax reform. I was willing to make that investment on the debt, uh, on the debt side because I believe in economic growth as a component to this solution, but we should have coupled it up with those spending reforms, at least maintain them on the discretionary side, and then take in the leadership role of pushing into the mandatory spending and go, take it to the American people, because it's going to take the American people joining with us to stand with us and go into uh, this uh, solution of a, of a magnitude of a problem that is so large it needs everything. Uh, I want to come table. back to the new tax law in a little bit, but mm -hmm. first, you mentioned you know everyone wants to be in control of the gavel. Why haven't some of these problem solver caucus initiatives made it further up into the leadership? Why why haven't they been picked up and carried forward? It's a great question, and that's what we're working on right now uh, as a group. To be perfectly honest with you, our group over the last year and a half has been very good. Uh, at developing the relationships, creating that trust environment, and putting together um, policy proposals that we organize to get to yes. And the problem that we, we've had is the same problem that many folks have, is that we, we have to create the leverage to get to the floor, that we have to get the leverage in order to get these issues uh, addressed with a vote. And right now, we are going through the process. We're potentially, as a caucus, having a discussion right now as we speak about reforming the institution so that when you have bipartisan bills, when you have certain levels of co-sponsorships, for example, is a reform I'm advocating for, that it goes from that proposal to the floor in a preferred kind of fast track type of uh, uh, mechanism. It will drive a bottom up type of approach and it will put members in control of putting these solutions out into the public domain where they need to go. And that's something we're working on as we speak in order to leverage that group of 48 to say to our leadership, enough is enough, we'll support you with in your speakership runs, et cetera, if you do these reforms that will help the institution address these problems. Broken process leads to broken outcomes, right? So you had, uh, in, in the chart that Michael showed, 
uh, with the exacerbation of the debt problem is demonstration of that. You saw a tax bill that um, added uh, over the next 10 years between 1.3 and $2 trillion uh, to the debt. Um, the challenge wasn't just the outcome of that. The challenge was the process. Uh, it was largely written behind closed doors. Uh, it was largely a top-down approach. Um, and as a consequence, it was uh, entirely partisan. Um, I think that's not the way to do uh, once-in-a-generation tax reform. Same thing on the spending side. So, you know, you had people who want to make sure that government's keeping the lights on and not having a government shut down, which is incredibly damaging, uh, fo uh, forced to choose between a clearly flawed spending bill uh, or a government shutdown. Both are bad options where you had less than 24 hours to look at all the details of it. That is not the way to do this. And so uh, I agree with Tom about the importance of, and I think it's important that the Problem Solvers Caucus and, and frankly other groups in Congress are starting to look at, okay, we don't know who's gonna be in charge next year. Maybe that's the time to think about not just the who, this town gets very obsessed with the who, who's gonna be in charge, who's gonna have the gavel, but more importantly, the how. How is this place going to function effectively? You know, I used to say that um, when I was back home, I'd always say, people say, how's it going back there? And I'd say, well, it's a fixer-upper. <laughs> um, but it's beyond a fixer-upper, right? Because, you know, when, when, when you have flooding in your basement, you don't just sweep the water out. Um, you recognize there are structural problems. Uh, we have structural problems in Congress right now. You know, some examples. At the beginning of every Congress, Republicans go on a retreat, Democrats go on their retreat, and by and large, the conversation is about how to, you know, uh, advocate that party's uh, platform rather than to advocate what's in the best interest of the country. I actually think it's important for Democrats and Republicans to actually talk with each other. It shouldn't be newsworthy when Democratic leadership and Republican leadership meet. That shouldn't be news, right? That should be something that is happening consistently, but it doesn't. Um, beyond that, um, the committee process, we have, it, it becomes very difficult to explain to my constituents when they say, wait a minute, there's a bipartisan plan on immigration, there's a bipartisan plan on healthcare, why isn't getting a vote? And I struggle to explain the inexplicable. You have to have processes in place where if there is strong bipartisan support for a proposal, let it get a vote. Um, there are other things, you know, and I think this Select Committee on Budget uh, Reform needs to take, uh, take up uh, some issues as well to try to get a handle specifically on the, on the fiscal matters. Part of the problem right now is Congress functions under the 1974 Budget Act. I, I'm sure this happened to you too. When I was a freshman member, they, you go in, you get freshman orientation, and they say, okay, so here's how the budget process works. And they give you like a 20 minute presentation on the 1974 Budget Act. And then when they finish the 20 minutes, they go, okay, but that's not how it works at all. And here's how it actually works. I mean, we haven't, we haven't passed appropriations yeah, bills on time across the floor since, since the mid-90s. So you actually have to have a process that actually somewhat uh, resembles reality. Well, and if I could add a, a, couple, uh, a couple other points. I mean, process, I agree wholeheartedly, is part of the solution. But right now, the, the country is in its, in, in, in its governance of extremism on the left and the right. And I will tell you, we have to, as a country, say, you know what, we're in this together. Um, and we gotta take on that extremism. And that's what the Problem Solvers Caucus is so important about, because we're willing to stand up uh, to our extremes and say, look, do you really want us to go into this battle and, and hold out for 100%? Or the old Ronald Reagan uh, adage, 80% is not a defeat, it's a victory. When you can find 80%, 75% coming together, we should celebrate that and take on that extremism. And when I find I go to those groups, because I, I engage them, I do town halls in our district, I go to our Tea Party groups, I go to them, and I work around the leadership that is of those organizations, those extreme movements, that are using it for political purposes, fundraising purposes, money purposes, you name it. There's a whole agenda over there. And you talk to the people on the ground, they encourage me. I've had Tea Party leaders in my local groups calling me saying, oh, that's a, that's a reasonable compromise. I explained Cooper La Tourette. I, I, I explained Simpson Bowles. They're like, well, I can live with that, so long as it's an honest deal. 
and it actually solves the problem. It is amazing when you talk to the American people and you have a conversation with them how powerful they are when they unite and they get information and this town just disregards that and plays smoke and mirrors day in and day out. But speaking of getting information, I mean, with all due respect to everyone here, this topic can be a little dry. And so when you're out talking to voters about debt and fiscal policy, you're, what you're really saying is your social security needs to change. You know, maybe those individual tax cuts can't be permanent to look for a more sustainable fiscal policy. How much do you even hear from voters on these issues and how do you talk to them about it? Good question. It doesn't come up enough, um, given uh, how big an issue it is. You know, the reality is the debt's a problem. You know, it's a drag on our economic growth. It means, as we saw in that, uh, in that video, you know, my kids and future generations are going to have to end up paying for the credit card bills that uh, our generations have racked up. Uh, debt service is, uh, is crowding out other priorities within the, uh, within the budget. Um, I think uh, it's part of the reason I think the Peterson Foundation's effort in this regard really matters. But I think there's things that Congress needs to do to shine a light on this too. So for example, I'm part of another bipartisan group. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm seeing other people. Uh, but, um, That's so, just a headline. Uh, uh, I'm, part of a group, I'm part of a group called the Bipartisan Working Group. It's a group of a uh, dozen Democrats and a dozen Republicans who meet for breakfast every, uh, every week. And we as a group introduced a bill called the Fiscal State of the Nation Bill. And it would require, on an annual basis, the Comptroller General of the United States to come address a joint session of Congress to actually walk through our nation's long-term fiscal challenges. Now, this may not get high ratings on C-SPAN, <laughs> um, but it actually matters because we have to, one, uh, shine a light on the issue, and two, have a common fact base. Now, I'll, I'll give you a personal example in this regard. I used to be 90 pounds heavier. and. Um, uh, blissful ignorance um, is not a strategy for solving a problem. I only started losing weight when I got on a scale. And I got on it every day um, uh, and chipped away at the problem. Right now, the debt is not uh, a sufficiently primed issue in the Capitol building or in the public. And those things that we can do to shine a light on the issue, uh, I think, are more likely to drive some action. So this idea that if people have the information, they would do something about it. This information is out there, and members of Congress certainly have access to this information. Members of Congress, as well as members of the public, often dismiss numbers about the debt and deficit. You have a CBO score that says that the tax bill is actually going to cost $1.9 trillion, and everyone says, no, that's not real. So how do you present information about a fiscal crisis when many people in the population and in Congress aren't going to believe the numbers? Sure. Well, um, one, I think it's important to protect the integrity of the umpire, right? You have to have someone who's willing to call legitimate balls and strikes. You know, I, I, if, if nothing else comes out of this budget and reform uh, committee, I hope one of the things that comes out of it is protecting the integrity of the Congressional Budget Office so that uh, that there isn't that sort of uh, game playing uh, to cook the books. Um, you know, I think the reason the, uh, the fiscal state of the nation bill chose the Comptroller General was not necessarily because it was going to drive high ratings, but it's seen as a legitimate, unbiased uh, source of information. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, and Tom spoke to this as well. There is an, a, a real uh, disposition in our politics to dismiss information that um, might not jibe with our, our worldview um, because we don't like the facts. Well, and I, a couple points. One, you know, we, this has been a long-standing battle uh, of who's right, who's wrong, and when, you, when you're getting out to projections, um, let's be honest, I can get it, it's like lawyers. You have 10 lawyers in a room and you get 10 different answers on a, on a legal problem. You know, ec economists tend to have the same conversations and arguments. So the bottom line is you can always argue about the numbers, but you can't argue about the common sense uh, solutions that are being put forward. Like we know, regardless of the number, we know Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, they're on an unsustainable path as they are today. Interest payments are going through the roof and continue to go through the roof. We know the amount of those, when they occur, we can have that argument all day long, but the bottom line is the root issue is agreed upon. 
And that's the, that's the issue that we face here in DC. Everyone knows what the issue are. Everyone knows what the problem is. Everybody knows what the solutions are. It's getting the people to understand this. And there's two ways you do it, in my opinion. One, you go to them and you say, how is this impacting you today? Because what, what people are struggling with, when I go back to the district and I spend those hours in these town halls talking to people, sitting with them, going to their living rooms, doing the, doing the work, they're, they're, they're worried about tomorrow. They're worried about their next paycheck. They're not looking at this thing as if this crisis is impacting them today. So then what I try to do is I put it in their terms. I, I go to senior citizens, our AARP groups, and I say, do you understand the problem that you have? Because they're always, some of them are complaining, you know, I put my retirement into money markets and I'm just not getting interest uh, returns. I'm getting a half a percent, a percent. And I go, do you understand where that's coming from potentially? It's from the debt. They can't raise interest rates. They can't give you a return on your money because if they do, and then you connect the dots for them, it will blow up the budget. And then you put it in terms of, understand a trillion dollar debt payment. We spent about $700 billion on all national security concerns. That means Army, Navy, Marines, you talk in terms of them as a vet, your VA, all those things. You then put in the terms, we would have to spend that amount of money overnight if interest rates went up to a normal type policy to cover just the interest payment on that. That's like your credit card bill going up from 4%, 18% to, to 18% overnight. They get those terms. You have to put it in their terms. So there's two ways to do it. You either explain it to them or the other way it's going to happen is the crisis will take hold. This bubble will burst, and you will have a financial calamity that will cause people to come together, because that's, that's the only other path I see. Either we proactively deal with it, or you, you deal with it when the catastrophe hits, and God forbid we're not strong enough as Democrats and Republicans to come together, unite as American citizens, because that's the only way we survive these types of calamities. One of, can, I, can I just yeah. hop on that? I would think one of the challenges also is that um, most of the oxygen gets sucked on uh, focusing on something that's not the biggest piece of the problem, yeah. and that's discretionary spending. Um, you know, in Congress, the biggest debate is not about the primary drivers, which are mandatory spending, and I would add tax expenditures um, and, and kind of overall revenue, which is where the tax bill does matter to have that conversation. But rather than having a robust debate about those significant drivers, the debate's generally about discretionary spending. And the challenge with that is it means uh, you end up squeezing some of the things that, um, one, are not the main driver, and two, contribute to economic growth over the long haul. You know, when, when we invest in infrastructure, which has been a priority for the Problem Solvers Caucus, mm -hmm. that helps grow our economy. When you invest in educating young people, that grows our economy. And unfortunately, uh, you know, if you looked at the strategy of sequestration, which was a very ham-fisted approach to trying to deal with our nation's long-term uh, fiscal challenges, all it did was sort of ham-fistedly cut discretionary spending. That is not the way to do this. You're both uh, discussing these larger systemic problems that are making this problem worse, but at the same time, both of you have voted for things that also make the problems worse, either the omnibus spending bill or the tax cuts. When does it actually come up that you will make a decision, I will not vote for this thing that adds to the deficit? You know, uh, you know from my perspective, if you look at the tax reform bill, and I know we can have the argument, I was willing to recognize the impact on the deficit there because the fundamental policy that is supported in the tax reform bill, and I worked on it for six years. I'm on the committee that wrote the bill. I'm on Ways and Means. We started this process six years ago, and I believe in economic growth as a component of the solution of dealing with the debt crisis. So what we had before us was a tax reform policy that lowered tax burdens in America. If you disagree with that policy that leads to growth, then you disagree with every governor in this state, you would disagree with every economic development agency in this state that is going around each of their, your states and putting together packages to reduce taxes to spur economic growth. So we can have an argument about the numbers. We can have an argument in DC about, well, is this number within the first 10 year budget window or will the growth outside the 10 and 20 year uh, budget overcome that deficit impact because the CBO only scores in 10 years versus 20 years and 30 years. This is the archaic argument in DC. So what I look at is, what is common sense? Common sense says lower taxes leads to growth. Love to have that paired up. That's why, that's why to, to Derek's point early on, this is a comprehensive problem that needs to be addressed because it's going to take growth 
on the tax side. It's going to take spending reforms and discretionary, mandatory spending uh, reforms to stabilize these programs and put them on a sustainable path. That's like Simpson Bowles. And we, there's no package here that has been on the floor that puts it all together in one substantive package. We were so close. When John Boehner was driving back up the hill, and he's a good friend of mine, that's the former speaker, we almost had the grand bargain. It, this is a thing I've been chasing since 2010. The grand bargain puts all these pieces together. And they had a deal when they walked out of the White House, and within 15 minutes, because of a couple phone calls, and the left hand and the right hand not knowing what they were doing in the Senate, it blew up. But we were there, and that's the kind of thing we have to put together again. And the Problem Solvers Caucus, in my opinion, is the only place that's going to occur in the House. Do you think that the tax cuts for individuals should be made permanent? I do. And do you think the tax law is going to pay for itself? I do, outside the 10-year budget window. I do. You know, a lot of people in this room are probably going to disagree with you on... I, I, I understand that, and that's where we can have that disagreement. But if you don't believe in the cornerstone policy, uh, uh, where the, the true disagreement would be if you don't uh, agree with that tax reform, lowering uh, tax burdens, leads to economic growth, then we're, we're going to disagree. But if we agree on that, what we're really talking about are the numbers. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to grow our way out of this, and we're going to have to get the spending down to match up with revenues that are coming in. So I, I, I think the tax law was a real missed opportunity, because as we went into this Congress, the reality is there were Democrats uh, who agreed with Republicans on the need for tax reform. It is undeniable that we had an uncompetitive tax code, an overly complicated tax code, uh, uh, and one that, um, from a competitiveness standpoint, didn't sufficiently encourage investment in the United States. Now, the difference is, um, I'm vice chair of the New Dem uh, Coalition. Our approach to the Ways and Means chair was to say, if we can do it in a way that, uh, that doesn't blow a giant hole in the debt, um, we, we want to help. We want to actually address some of these problem statements. Clearly, that is not what the bill that was put before Congress did. I also think it's very difficult, Just and this is where process does matter, it's very difficult to get people there for the landing when they're not invited for the takeoff. Good point. You know, the, the, simply from the standpoint of both on the tax bill, I would say the same thing on, on the spending side. You know, the ability for members to um, have a say in the process uh, is really limited by the fact that a lot of these big, big bills, uh, the final versions get cooked up behind closed doors. With leadership. They're, with leadership. They're, On both sides. They're, they're, not, the important they're not subject to amendment. Um, the tax bill wasn't subject to amendment on the floor. Neither was the spending bill. I think that is really a problem. Now, to get to your question, where it becomes tough. I mean, I've been in a dozen meetings with dozens of people who say, you know what, I'm just not going to vote for a continuing resolution ever again. Because continuing resolutions are really a bad way to do business, right? You say, you say we're going to continue last year's spending regardless of changes in priorities. It's, I, the largest employer in my district is the United States Navy. I can tell you when we come on the eve of a potential shutdown, the amount of churn that's required for the Navy, the amount of waste, uh, the fact that they have to issue furlough notices to their employees. Think about contracting, right? If you contract for a service, you are not getting the best deal if you contract two weeks or two months at a time rather than a year or two at a time. So these continuing resolutions are really damaging. Now, we say, well, I'm just not going to vote for a continuing resolution again. And then you're faced with 10 o'clock the night before a government shutdown. Are you going to vote? yes on a continuing resolution and avert a shutdown, or are you going to vote for something you see as deeply flawed? This is why this issue around process really matters. If, you know, the way I define the mission of this Joint Committee on, on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform... We've got to come up with a better name. We've got to have a better name. <laughs> um, is how do you stop the threat of shutdown and these continuing resolutions that go on forever? So... I hear the problems, I'm not hearing the solutions yet. Where are the solutions? You talked about hopefully it doesn't happen when there's a crisis. Well, we're expanding spending and stimulus in a, at the you know, top end of a growth cycle. So, and then the share of our annual spending that's going to payments on the national debt is increasing, decreasing our flexibility to respond to a crisis. So where are the solutions in terms of fiscal policy? Well, I'll tell you, for, it, 
you have to drive the process reforms first, in my opinion, yes. because but those are part of the, those are part, because you will never get to the But solution. what is going to happen? Like, what is in the works? I, I hear you're mm -hmm. about the budget reform process. I hear about the Problem Solvers Caucus, but what is actually happening to address this issue? Well, in regards to substantive policy on the floor of the House and Senate, nothing. That's the problem. That is the problem. And so how do you change that, um, that paradigm? And what we're trying to do is break the, 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 reform the institution to have a process that allows these issues to come up and be voted on and, and have, a, have their moment uh, in the sun, so to speak. And then on top, because the substantive solutions, this is, this, is the, this is the most frustrating thing to me as a member of Congress since 2010. The solutions, everyone knows what they are. You talk to any member who, who is actually engaged and engaged members, now there's different types of members. Derek is an engaged member. He gets into the policy. We, we roll up our sleeves and get other members. They love having the door opened up for them and, and giving a pin on their thing and that's their whole purpose in life. That's frustrating to me. But the members that are engaged, they know what the solutions are on both sides of the aisle. All the experts know what the solutions are. And it's, it's some sort of a form of Simpson Bowles or Cooper La Tourette. It's some sort of, of balancing revenue with spending reforms. But you know what? You get into the spending reforms. So the question is, why does this exist? Because it's hard to do it politically. It's hard to do it. And you don't have that leadership yet that is saying enough is enough, except in our caucus, in my opinion, or a, a bunch of us that have come here to really change this place, that are leaning into this and saying, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to solve these problems, and we're going to put these packages together. Because like, take tax reform, like I was saying. Tax reform was on the floor. You had an up or down vote on tax reform. That's only a piece of the solution. You didn't have the opportunity to put the deal together of that grand bargain. And if that type of deal is brought to the floor, I bet you there are, there are more than 218 members here and 60 members in the Senate. Those are the two numbers we've got to live by that would be willing to give up this pin, give up uh, their title in order to come here and say, I was part of that generation that solved that problem for uh, this country for generations to come, more than willing to walk away. And we're coming up on the midterms, and voters might be saying to themselves, okay, you guys have been here. The solutions are known. The experts do have the solutions. So what risk do you feel like the people in Congress right now, you all sitting there, have to face from voters who look at you and say, if you all have the solutions but can't do anything, why are we keeping you in office? If voters are frustrated, they have every right to be. Um, I think what you've seen out of Congress has been far too much partisan bickering and not enough focus on making progress on behalf of the American people. Listen, the, you know, the folks I represent, and I, I really appreciate Tom's leadership of the Problem Solvers Caucus in this regard, the folks I represent most, frankly, don't give a rip about whether we get more Democratic or more Republican or move more to the left or more to the right. They just want to stop moving backwards and start moving forward and actually solve some of these issues. I, I, as, as frustrating as it sounds, I mean, I, I agree there's broad agreement on what solutions ought to look like. One, rule number one of getting out of a hole, stop digging. Uh, that's part of the problem you've seen out of this Congress, as you saw in Michael's slides. The hole is getting worse, not better. Uh, two, and I said this earlier, the big moving pieces of what the solution ought to look like mean that the far right of the Republican Party and the far left of the Democratic Party are likely going to be frustrated with any grand bargain. Um, that lends itself to Democrats and Republicans holding hands and doing this together. It's the only way for this to happen because to your point, it is too easy to game this politically and use it to bludgeon your political opposition. I, honestly, yeah, I think the folks who came here to seriously get some stuff done I'm willing to take that vote if it's a legitimate effort to solve the problem. I think most of us don't want to, um, like, I'm here to make laws, not to make political statements. Fair, but when it comes to stopping the digging or stopping the bleeding, you basically are going to have to make decisions as a member of Congress about whether or not to support a piece of legislation <laughs> that you know is going to add to the deficit that might be harmful to your constituents if you do not support it. So when do you make that decision? For example, you know, do you support uh, making the individual tax cuts permanent? Not all of them. Um, you know, I, I, and again, I, and we agree on a lot, we disagree on some things. To me, it is undeniable that the 
uh, you know, from from most credible economic analysis, that the tax uh, that the tax bill um, is adds to the deficit and adds to our long-term uh, debt. Um, I think middle-class families need a break, uh, and I represent a lot of them. But you know, I think part of the challenge with the tax bill is if you talk to folks in my neck of the woods, their general sense is this bill wasn't for me. This bill didn't help me. The middle-class families I represent feel like they may get some short-term benefit, but over the long haul, the benefits don't accrue to the everyday Americans that I represent. Um, I would like to see if Congress is gonna deal with tax policy, one, for it to focus on providing support, long-term support for middle-class families. Two, trying to address our nation's uh, competitiveness. I think this bill did that in some respects, but there are still some things that I think need fixing. And then when it comes to uh, debt reduction, I think the other thing that needs to be uh, on the table is looking at tax expenditures. David Perdue in our joint committee that needs a new name um, <laughs> yesterday <laughs> talked about the importance of looking at, at the whole picture, mandatory spending, uh, tax expenditures, and the discretionary side. And right now, um, that's not happening in Congress, and it needs to. So we only have a couple minutes left, the two of you. Other than the Problem Solvers Caucus, where is the home for fiscal conservatives in Congress right now or in politics? Uh, I think there's a, a large home uh, for members that really are committed to that and recognize this problem. You talk to any member, uh, like I said, who's engaged, they, they know what needs to be done. They recognize uh, this problem. To your question about you know, politically, uh, where do we stand? Uh, and because we've been here, why would someone reelect us? I, I would offer this. If it's not us who are here that are putting our, are not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. These guys in the Problem Solvers Caucus, we're taking positions. Uh, we vote for things. I vote for like Cooper La Tourette, one of 38 on the Republican side. These just are- because some people might be streaming online very quickly can you explain what that yeah, is. Yeah, it, it's essentially, it was a budget proposal. It was a bipartisan budget proposal uh, about eight years ago uh, that took Simpson Bowles and, and was really a grand bargain in a budget format that said, we we're gonna deal with this on a tax increase, tax revenue side in exchange for mandatory uh, spending relief, discretionary spending relief, and uh, other issues to get these things on sustainable path. It was a true bargain. It was a true bargain. And I, I will tell you, if you want to continue to elect folks that want to take the easy path, and that may be the easier path for them to do in political uh, realms because they'll just sit back and let the, the fireworks go off and then say, okay, I'm, I don't want to be collateral damage in that. Or do you want to elect leaders like Derek? Here's a Republican vouching for a Democrat who says, He's doing the right thing. He is stepping forward. He is trying to take on this battle in a sincere way. Those are the type of, of leaders we need here. And that's where this group is so important. We get more increase to the ranks. We need more of us. And that's why there's groups outside now that are standing with us to protect us. Because when we have done this before, the hard right and the hard left take us out. They take us out. We are a threat to them. But now we have organizations across the country that are stepping up and, and highlighting it, putting out the PR issues like the Peterson Foundation, but also standing with us in those election uh, cycles to say, we, got, we have your back. And that gives us political courage in order to continue. Congressman to Kilmer, forward. to be more specific with that question, yeah. where is the home for the fiscal conservative where you can actually see those changes happening? Yeah, I actually think the Problem Solvers Caucus does matter in this, because if you are going to solve this, it's going to take a bipartisan solution, and frankly, the Problem Solvers Caucus, the Bipartisan Working Group, these, works, these groups that are trying to bring Democrats and Republicans together, to me that's the path toward getting something done on, on, uh, on our long-term debt issue. The other thing I'll mention though is, you know, Lincoln said it very well. He said public sentiment is everything. To a large extent, uh, elected officials are responsive to their constituents. Um, when the public demands that we work together and solve some of this stuff, uh, I think it's more likely that you see elected officials mm -hmm. solve it. I mean, I had a crazy experience when I first got to Congress. We had a group of uh, three Democrats and three Republicans go out to a burger joint, and we're sitting greeting burgers, and it was a very nice conversation. About 45 minutes in, I said, yeah, it seems like we ought to be able to get some of this stuff worked out. And one of my colleagues, it just so happened to be a, a Freedom Caucus member from the Midwest. He said, Derek, I like you. He said, but here's what you don't understand. He said, my, my first vote when I got here was a vote against John Boehner for speaker, and I was applauded back home for that vote. I, and I sent out a press release saying, that guy is too compromising. He said, you know, 
I, I like you, but my constituents didn't send me here to work with you. They sent me here to stop you. And I walked out of that burger joint, and I called my wife, and I said, one, how incredibly honest and forthcoming, and two, oh my God, right? Like, that's a real problem. A real problem. And I don't know if that's what his constituents were clamoring for. I do think the American people are clamoring for the type of bipartisanship, the type of problem solving that Tom and the Problem Solvers Caucus collectively that we're trying to bring to the Congress. So um, we're going to keep pushing. I actually think the boat moves best when all oars are in the water rowing in the same direction. Too often these days the oars are out of the water beating each other over the heads. That is not the way to get this done. We've got to have collectively as a country recognize that we are Americans first not Democrats and Republicans. We are Americans first. If we're going to solve that, we have got to embrace that ethic. And you want leaders who are willing to stand up to those extremes and say, you know what, let's continue the conversation and fight for what's right for the American people. Well, I guess we'll see what the American people really want come I November. Trust them. Congressman Tom Reed of New York, thank you so much. And Congressman Darren, Derek Kilmer of Washington. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thanks, and everybody. Well done. All right. Well done. Nope. Not pulling. And everyone, there's going to be a brief coffee break now, so please get up, stretch your legs, and go ahead and tweet your thoughts. Again, the hashtag is Fiscal Summit. Thank you all so much. Hashtag Fiscal Summit.